so it is my pleasure and okay. honor it is my pleasure and honor today to have professor antoine barbari with us he is a well known speaker and professor in the middle east he is the president elect of middle east society of organ transplantation professor of medicine lebanese university of medical sciences head of nephrology division and renal transplant unit uh, rafiq al harir university hospital and senior consultant and all of us know professor antoine barbari i know him since more than 15 years and i know him by his excellency in presentation and his thoughts and the ideas and i i um, uh, i always admire your presentation dear professor antoine and i your presentation today is very unique because it is non non traditional subconscious mind and gut microbiota what they got to do with our state of health the mic is with you professor antoine Thank you, Hussain, for this nice uh, introduction. Um, this is a, 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 a lecture that uh, I gave not too long ago in, um, in, in Georgia and the Arab Society of Nephrology and Transportation. Uh, it is a, uh, it's a new way, as you will see, of as a patient as a, a, a combined mind and soul, we don't, as we, we do not, we should no longer split the, the soul from the body and the mind from the body, as we will see. And in order to do this, uh, I will be starting first to see how we define the human being, uh, that we deal with the, this entity on a daily basis as physicians. Second, we'll look at the subconscious mind because the title of the, of the lecture, it is what has to do with the subconscious mind and the microbiota with our well-being. So you will understand why I'm talking like this. And third, we're living certainly today in a chronic, uh, uh, in, in, in a state of a chronic stress. Uh, our environment, as you can see today all over the world, is almost collapsing because of an invisible uh, primitive organism that we cannot even detect on the microscope. So we'll see what is the effect of this chronic stress, what it's doing to us and to our well-being. I will talk also about the gut microbiota and in health and disease. And you will see that I will show you that there is now emerging significant amount of uh, 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 information that is emerging in the medical literature regarding uh, this interaction be between the gut microbiota and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And then I will finish with some, some, some take home message. Okay. So, okay. The first, the human being, you know, the human being as I see it and as now is more and more we're, we're seeing it, it is a oneness of the body, mind, soul and their harmony uh, all together. Uh, imagine the human being as, as a vehicle, and in this vehicle there is a, an incarnation of a soul. The vehicle has a body, and what happens is that the human has to function. This should be a, a, a relation to the body that will be coordinated by the mind, and the mind has to comply. Now, in order for the human being to function, we are supposed to function in perfect harmony. Harmony between the soul and the body that should, as supposed to be ensured by the, by, by the mind, with its two components, the conscious and the subconscious. Now, in order for this harmony to take place, uh, uh, energy has to... Remember, we are in an energetic uh, energetic entity. We have a field of energy that connects us to the universal energy. And this energy uh, is very important for this energy to flow all the way, uh, you know, from the universe all the way through us. Now, this, the source of this energy, it is a divine source. It's, it's Allah, the universal energy. So it's extremely important 
for this energy that where it comes from the source to flow through us and to come back to the source. Jalal al-Din rumi I'm sure you all uh, 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 heard about him. Uh, he says, he wrote, my body is in love with the soul and my soul is in love with my body. I open my arms to love and love embraced me like a lover. So even at that time, they saw the importance of this harmony between the love, uh, between uh, the, the body, soul, which in common it is the love, that it, uh, the, the, the factor of harmony. I'll go back to the vehicle, so that we have a vehicle, the human, the human, it is a vehicle in which incarnate a soul. The soul is supposed to be in contact with this, or to, to harmonize with the body. And the body, this is the body of the vehicle, it is, needs a driver. The driver, there are two pilots, and this is, the conscious mind is supposed to be the driver, it has two components. The subconscious mind, which is the pilot. He is a very powerful pilot, very powerful mind. He can do many, many functions at the same time. He can take us anywhere we want to go. The most important problem with this pilot is he's blind, he cannot see. So he needs guidance. The guidance comes from the conscious mind, which is a co-pilot that receives the information from the soul and the soul re receives the information from the divine. So you see it's, it's a oneness. It's, it's a one system, it's a continuous system. And this system has to be harmonious for us to be living in a good state of health. Now, the human body, as we all know, it's a bioenergetic machine. It's a very complex bioenergetic machine that uh, uh, possesses three information of circuits that is very important for this machine to function. It needs the circuits. What are the circuits? The circuits are very important because they combine all together. They harmonize again. So we have harmony within our body also. They combine together to form a unique message, to form a function, which is the human function. That, and we divide them into three, and this is what I'm talking today is science. So these uh, circuits, the first, it is the neurological circuits, which use a, an electrical, and it's, a, it's an electrical and chemical circuit. There is a mechanical uh, uh, circuit, which is, uh, in fact, uses a physical, electrical, and chemical processes. Uh, and there is finally the most important, it is the energetic circuit, which is a quantum endocrine physical circuit. It is an energy that resonates, it is an invisible energy. And we know today more and more with quantum physics, that this might be the import, most important component that make us function as humans. So the neurological, this is a neurological which we said, it is... Uh, it is by our sensory system, the five sensory system. It uses that perception of the brain. And then the brain uh, translated into a thought and an emotion, which is chemical and lead to the formation of neurotransmitters, which could have a negative action if the stimulation and the perception is negative, or a positive action uh, is if the stimulation is perceived as a negative stimulation. The speed of the system, it is 75 meter per second. The second circuit, it is a mechanical circuit, which is triggered by compression and stretching, and it does not need the brain here to intervene. And here also it involves three processes. First, the mechanical process that triggers an electrical response within our cells and our body that leads to a chemical reaction and then in action. And finally, we have the energetic system, which as we said, the invisible energy involving electromagnetic and undulatory energy, it, it's, it, it vibrates, it resonates, and this is where most of our sensation, emotion, you know, function, it is through energy. It, it is uh, uh, three speed of the neurological system. So it is the fastest speed and the most preferred uh, uh, system by our uh, bioenergetic machine. Now, if we want to look at the humanity, first we said we are in perfect coherence and harmony within ourselves, thanks to the circuits. We interact together as humans. We are all connected to Allah, to the universal energy or to God, through the mother nature, which is part of the universe. So you see the system is one. The Holy Quran says that we are all planets revolving in our own orbits around Allah. So you see it's, our ancestors, these great humans that came before us, 
really they saw today what we are able to prove in, in, in science. They saw it uh, in, in their spiritual way through the way, the powerful way of observing Mother Nature. Now, again, back to the vehicle. So we said we have a conscious, the, 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 the mind has three components. This is the way some people divided. First, we have the unconscious mind, which control our vital function, important for survival. And we know today that the, with the virus, uh, the coronavirus, that uh, uh, affect, is affecting our immune system. Uh, it's also affecting our respiratory system and our cardiac. And most of the cardio, most of the mortality today is from cardiovascular mortality related to the impairment of our immune system. The second mind, it is the subconscious mind. It is a mind of memory, of feelings, of emotion and behavior. This is the most powerful mind, as we said, and it, it has the, an, an incredible, unlimited space for memory. It has all the memories, all the programs. The problem with the subconscious mind, as we said, it's blind. It needs guidance, and the guidance is supposed to come from the conscious mind. The conscious mind, it is the human mind, it is the mind of logic, of critical thinking, of creativity, of imagination, of willpower, of intelligence, and most important, of love. Now, the subconscious mind control the unconscious mind. We know this and we'll see it now at an anatomical level. Conscious mind, in contrast to the subconscious mind, control only the breathing and the respiratory function. And this is one of the reasons we use uh, today in meditation and breathing as a therapy for relaxation and for stress release, because this way, by focusing the conscious mind uh, on breathing, we disconnect the conscious from the subconscious, and we silence the subconscious mind, which is usually is the problem of most of our anxiety. The conscious mind, as a human, is supposed to control the subconscious mind. It's supposed to guide the subconscious mind. Unfortunately, when we are under stress, this connection is, becomes completely disconnected and we're left at the mercy of our subconscious mind, as we will see. Anatomically, on the left, you can see the brain, the three components of the brain with the three correlates of the mind. We have the reptile brain, which is, uh, by definition, reptile brain. It's where the unconscious mind is. The second is we have the midbrain or the animal brain or the emotional, which is this and, oh, uh, and, and it, it's, it correlates with the subconscious mind. And finally, the third and most voluminous part of the brain, which is the neocortex, this is related to the conscious mind. This is the human mind. The drive for consciousness through the evolutionary process had led to the increase in the volume of the neocortex that correlated with the increase in the number uh, of the group size, you know, from you know, being the cell to the monkey to the apes and finally to the human. That's why the human have the most important and the most voluminous uh, 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 neocortex as compared to all animals. When it comes to the subconscious mind, as we said, it controls two, uh, uh, two important things. First, there are vital functions. What are the vital functions? Are hunger, thirst, body temperature, water, salt, and balance, sexual function, emotion, sleep, and the hormonal system. The second important function of subconscious mind, it impacts on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and we all know that, that's why, you, as you can see it in the figure, the hypothalamus uh, secretes hormones that impact on the pituitary gland, which is anterior lobe, which secretes most of the hormones, and the posterior lobe, which secretes predominantly the ADH, the antidiuretic hormone. The second part is now we have to look what is the subconscious mind, how the subconscious mind is programmed, and it is programmed, as you will see, by a what we call a domestication. This takes uh, a place during the first six, seven years of our life. Why? Because uh, our brain function in a theta act, uh, a wave activity is a, like a hypnosis, like in hypnosis. The brain acts as a sponge and it acquires all the patterns, the thoughts and the belief and the emotions that we receive from our environment. And these patterns become hardwired in the subconscious mind 
in the form of programs that later on control our behavior and outcome later on in life. And as we will see that the subconscious mind control 95% of our brain activity and only 5% is left for our conscious mind. And this is a simple calculation I've done. If you look at our daily activity, what we do, and if we look at our lifetime, 80 years lifetime, we, we spend 3.5 years of our lifetime only in a conscious uh, activity, which represents 4%. And 96% of our the time during our lifetime, we spend it in a subconscious state. Now, new evidence is uh, uh, emerging that, in fact, this domestication starts early on, way before our birth. It's, in fact, at the fetal, uh, in the fetal state, where the very important relationship with mother fetus. They are chemical relationship and electromagnetic relationship. Uh, the mother, through whatever happened to the mother, chemically it's transferred to the ch child, and anything that electromagnetically affects the mother, it will also affect the child. In addition to the fact when the child grows, it becomes an independent entity, even at the time when he's a fetus, and he has his independent contact and his independent perception from the environment, chemically and electromagnetically. These are very important researchers where they look at the influence of environment on the human development. And I'm not going to go and uh, show you all the, the, the data that they have, but in conclusion, they concluded that there are three periods that appear to be conducive for important epigenetic changes. First, as we said, the embryonic development, the early childhood, already this is mentioned, and very important also during the adolescence period because of the great upheaval of the hormonal system that we, we, we generate. And very important conclusion also that they saw that many pathologies who declare themselves to adulthood might have a link with this early event. This is another uh, Swiss uh, uh, researcher where she looked, worked uh, intensively on the brain metabolic alteration in mice subjected to postnatal traumatic stress. Uh, and what happened to them to, and to their offsprings. These are experiments were conducted with separated neonates mice from their mother at birth. Then they reunite them. Then they separated them again two weeks after birth. Then they reunited them one week before weaning. And once they became adult, they follow up these mice. And what they have seen, because of the separation, traumatic separation, they found once become adult, these mice, young mice, have developed all kinds of pathologies, depressive symptoms antisocial behavior, memory and blood sugar problems, and the most important that the characteristic found in the descendant sometimes went up to, uh, was transmitted up to fourth generation, which tell us today and is similar to today what's happening with society today, that because of the strain, the financial economical strain where the couple have to work, quite often this, the babies are uh, uh, separated, early on from the mothers. and we can see today as we will see later the the impact on this on on the young younger generation that are coming and today there is a significant amount of data uh, emerging on looking at the importance of the maternal uh, conditions and the maternal well-being uh, and their impact on the fetus later on in life and these are all studies to show this and very important study where they looked at the uh, in woman who were uh, pregnant woman who had a high level of anxiety during mid gestation, uh, this uh, their state was associated. The, the, the newborn from this woman uh, there was associated. They had a decrease in the gray matter density in six to eight years uh, old children. They follow up these children with MRI after birth, and they show that those children who were born from a pregnant woman with high level of anxiety, they had a shrinking in their gray matter as compared to those who were born from mothers who did not have this anxiety. And you can see here in the two graphs on the left hand side, over the last few years, the emergence of the number of studies that are addressing the issue of prenatal stress and its impact on the gene expression of the, of the fetus. And most important on the right hand side, the number of studies looking at the prenatal stress and its impact on the child development later on in life 
at the psychological, emotional, and the physical level. Now, we're talking about the domestication. So we have three major domesticating institutions, which are the family, religion, and politics. I already spoke about the family, the mother mainly, and the mother father, religion, and politics. And most important today, as we can see on, on TV and through the social media, the media play a major role today in the, our domestication. And all this is under control of the financial, uh, international financial monetary system. This is a system, monetary system, I'm not going to go through it. You can, you can see the reading for the, the industrial complex, the financial establishment, the information technology, they playing a major role. They are in total control of our domestication. They do it through the media, which control all the parties involved in the domestication to end up with the mother and the parents to, in order to domesticate the child, which once become adolescent, it becomes a domesticator himself. Religion, the only religion today, unfortunately, the universal religion that everybody agree on and everybody fight for, and we can see today what's going on in the world, it is the, the, you know, the money. And in fact, in, in the States, on the $1 bill, if you can see, it's written in God we trust. We were always told never believe in two gods, money and God. Well, here they unified this, it was simplified and we become, the money became our universal God, unfortunately. What are the tools for this domestication? The tools are, in fact, as you will see, these tools are a, a, a tool of a negative domestication process. It's fear, it's anger. We use guilt, shame, blame, hate, revenge, and sanction. But the most important domesticating tool, it is fear. And look what's happening today. You know, with the coronavirus, they're making us do things, crazy things, because we are afraid, because humanity is afraid. In spite of all our might, we lost our intelligence because we are afraid. All this domestication is to protect a system of reward punishment system. If we are good, we get rewarded. If we are bad, we get punished. And all this to build the most dangerous three combination letters, the ego, the moi, the I, the Anna, it is the, uh, it is the hero and the saboteur at the same time, depending how it is programmed. You know, so this whole domestication purpose, the domestication process, at the end point, it is to build our ego. Now, this conditioning process or this domestication process results into an individual and collective subconscious state, which lead us to focus mainly on, as we see today, on materialism, on consumerism, on greed, fame, politics, and religion. Why all this? Because these are the ingredients of power. We love power. We love to be controlled. We are in a game of being, because we are afraid of being controlled, we want to control. And this is, in fact, this between being controlled and wanting to control really generate from our inside the stressful situation that most of the time we're living in. So the subconscious mind programmed by these acquired beliefs has a major influence on our perception and, uh, 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 and, and the amplification. And this brings me now to the chronic stress. What is chronic stress? And what is the consequence of this chronic stress? You know, every time the normal physical reaction to a stress, when we are exposed to a stress, so when we feel threatened or upset or afraid, this is triggers in us into a, a fight or flight response. This is, has been designed by the evolutionary process for us to keep us alive, to keep us being able to survive. So either we have to fight or we have to flight. And this is, is supposed to be usually if we are attacked by a lion or by a bear, or by an elephant, you know, for a few minutes, either we fight or we flight, and then we have to switch to something else. Now, how this happened? Once we, the stress, when we are, in any particular stress is perceived uh, through our uh, uh, prefrontal uh, cortex. This is triggered usually the limbic system and the hypothalamus to produce uh, trans neurotransmitters that lead to the production of certain hormones that ultimately will lead to the production of adrenaline and cortisol. These are the two major uh, uh, hormone, uh, stress hormone, what we call stress hormone. And this leads, of course, to uh, uh, tachycardia, to increase in breathing, uh, uh, the, uh, 
increase in respiration. Of course, we need glucose. We need to produce glucose because it's a source of energy and because we need to uh, shift our blood to the periphery. Why? Because when we are uh, uh, in stress, we need to fight or flight. We need our muscles. So all the blood is shifted to our extremity. So any state of alert will trigger a chain reaction start with the neurological stimulus, then lead to hormonal stimulation, physiological uh, uh, response, and then would lead ultimately to an action. Once the threat, the threat is, ends, then this is with uh, the hypothalamus will stop producing all these hormones and will switch to a relaxation uh, mode. What are the stress that we have? We have four types of stress, mechanical stress, chemical, emotional, and physical. And we know today we have the chemical are to the corona that is doing what is doing to humanity. Look at the importance of the relaxation period following the stressful uh, response. We have eight hormones, and each hormone that we call them the happiness hormones, it's dedicated to a specific feeling. So look how important this the, the relaxation. And when we have chronic stress, the problem, if we cannot fight or we cannot flight, we switch to a, what we call a protective response. And this, again, was designed by nature, you know. It's like you see the human, you know, we hide our head. And like the ostrich, putting her head into the... So it is a freeze retraction response. If it is for temporary, it is temporary, then it's fine, no problem with it. The problem when it is chronic and it lasts for a long period of time, and this is the response, would be the response for the chronic stress, it is a continuous stress hormone production of cortisone and adrenaline. The, you know, through the evolutionary process, the, our gene have developed through the adaptation to the stress, two types of protective responses. If we are in a healthy, loving environment, it is growth and reproduction. If we are in an unhealthy and stressful environment, in the acute phase, we have a fight flight response. In a chronic phase, we have a protection retraction response. Now, what happened to the domestication? What happened? What, what it does to us, this domestication? You know, most of us, most of humans, we believe that we are an entity, we are a physical entity, uh, that uh, we are here to live a, try to live a spiritual uh, a state uh, before we go back, where it, we, we, before we die. In fact, it's much better to look at it, and this is my way of looking at it, and probably other people also way, that instead of being a, a no doubt we are, as we said, we are the vehicle. But remember, it is the soul that it incarnates the vehicle. So I think the way I look at it, it is we, ha we are a spiritual state that incarnate into a physical entity that try to live a, a materialistic life through which we refine uh, the soul before it goes back to the origin after that, where there is disintegration of the physical entity and the energy, the soul goes back to the, to, to the, to the creator. The problem is, since if we think about it this way, then we look at the domestication outcome in a different way. There are some people who get domesticated and accept this domestication process in order to live the humanity dream. If we are a spiritual entity, there are some spirits, some souls, who resist this domestication. And that's what we call the resistant. They could be what we call them the crazy, the original, the rebel. And who are the rebel? I divide them into three groups. The retract, the warriors, which could be a violent warrior. And this is, you know, the people who are the antisocials that were recruited by, you know, uh, uh, by many organizations in the world, you know, and uh, to become the Daesh that was spread all over the Middle East. Or become, become, you know, the warrior could be pacific, which means now the violent, uh, the problem with the violent is the system is stronger than them. They end up being either killed or being put into jail. The second kind of warrior is the pacific warrior. These are people who have enough strength. They are refusing the domestication outcome. They develop their own system to work in parallel to the domestication process without being belonging to it where they can improve themselves and they can get stronger and stronger and they become 
the role model through which they can change themselves or by changing themselves, they can change their environment. These are the one today, the role model of the world. Now, sometimes we can have from the retract, we can have people who become Pacific warrior or people who are violent, they become also Pacific warrior. Who are the retracts? The retract are all this. These are the people who are not happy with the system, but they don't have the enough strengths to not to fight the system or to create their own system. So they are, they surrender. They are the one who surrender. They are the one who develop eating troubles such as bulimia, anorexia nervosa, or obesity. The one who develop addiction to drug, addiction to screen, addiction to, uh, uh, to all kinds of addiction. These are the ones who become anxious, who become depressed, who become suicidal sometimes. And we know today that autism is increasing tremendously over the last 30, 40 years. I truly believe that autism, it is a state of retraction. We can see it at least physically, the way these children are uh, disconnected from their environment. And probably this might be related to what's going on into the, uh, uh, their uh, uh, fetal life that could affect them to become the way they, they become. Now, if we live in a positive, creative, healthy environment, the conscious mind is supposed to be in control of the subconscious mind. And in order to do this, we need certain nutrients of the mind and for the soul. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you see the diversity of nutrients that God has given us to be able to enjoy this, to be in a perfect harmony. And most important nutrient, of course, is love. And with love, this is, will develop into us is a, a feeling of gratitude that would lead to sharing, pleasure, and happiness. The problem today is we're living, as you can see again, as we are living today, we're living in a continuous emotional and stressful environment as it is the case today that humanity is facing. And when we are like this, as we said, there is a total disconnection between the conscious mind and subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, which is our supposed to be our bodyguard, takes over because it's a life-threatening situation, and it switch and put us into this continuous and persistent fight or flight stress response. And it put us into a survival mode. We become self-deprived from all the sources of pleasure, of, of happiness. Everything disappears. We lose our intelligence. We switch to the control. We become completely controlled by the, uh, 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 by the subconscious mind that has been programmed by the, during the domestication process, it put us into a stress response, which is mediated by both adrenaline and cortisol. And now it's not a question of few minutes of adrenaline and cortisol. It is a question of a lifetime living a stressful life, unhappy life, you know, where we are, have significant increase in the production of these two uh, uh, important hormones. Without them, we die with the excess of them. Also, we'll die as we will see. So what is the impact of this uh, long-term effect of, uh, of this adrenaline and uh, cortisol secretion? You can see it affects all, excuse me? Yeah, we can, we can have uh, some questions here. Yes. Yes, please. If any one of the audience need to ask Professor Barbari, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy. We have uh, Professor Daulat Bilal with us. Do you have any questions, Dr. Daulat? Uh, not right now. I have a comment that uh, yes, thank you very much for this talk. Away from the cytokines and the, and the antibodies for a change. I'm trying to concentrate very much to uh, to, uh, to understand. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the cytokine and the and the antibodies they are part of because we talk about the immune system. It's yeah. uh, it's a new way of looking uh, globally at the picture and not into detail. The problem with uh, uh, conventional medicine, um, they, they, they were, there are two problems. The first problem is the separation between uh, 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 the soul and the, and the body and the mind. Uh, and as we can see, uh, we cannot separate them. And second, today, most of the diseases, as I will be showing you, that humanity is suffering from, uh, it is a, they are a physical manifestation of a disturbance uh, in the energy. And when we treat chemically this patient, 
you know, through all kind of treatment, chemical treatment, it is like when we give uh, Panadol or Tylenol to a fever coming from a cancer. So in order for us to deal with this, this tremendous pathology that we, our physicians are dealing with today, uh, I think it is better if we change our way of looking at our patient and think in a different way, uh, you know, at the complexity of the human being, that it's not only a chemistry, it is in fact, it's chemistry and it is energy, uh, it is, uh, uh, it is a combination of both with a, 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 an unbelievable perfection. All right. I cannot hear. Saying I cannot hear you. You want me to continue? I continue, I go. Okay. You heard me now? There is a problem with not hearing. So, can you hear me? Yeah, I, no, hear, I hear you. you. I hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you very well. Yeah. Okay. So, you the, want me to continue my, my or? Point, my point to Professor Barbary. Uh, uh, I believe in the emotions and in the in all these powers because the performance of any body or any person depends upon his uh, power his ability and his willingness and emotions. So I think there is a harmony between emotion and subconscious and the abilities that we have. Absolutely. Uh, and the second uh, point, you mentioned um, uh, many times during your, this part of your presentation, coronavirus. Uh, do you release any guidelines from Mesot or still you, you are waiting No, the, we don't have from Mesut, but uh, there are, if you're interested, there is a, the, uh, the American Society of Transplantation have, I think, released some, uh, some guidance for transplantation. And the European also uh, society, the, um, you know, the NDTA, they also, I think, released some, uh, uh, some, 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 uh, some guidelines. Okay. Uh, in fact, you know, maybe one day, another day, we'll talk about the corona uh, and the impact of the electromagnetic and change of electromagnetic field that is imposed upon us through the 5G technology that might be uh, behind the corona yes. uh, virus. But this is another, another issue. I think I'm the, now. the major problem in all these uh, axes of subconscious and emotions is that we believe in the ex experiment. So it, it is very difficult to be uh, caught by the usual brain. Uh, absolutely, because you see, as I said, when we are afraid, saying we lose our intelligence, we cannot think anymore. Yeah. So it's it's important. Then every whatever you learn, if you ever learn something, because to learn you have to be intelligent. Whatever you learn is going to be pushed upon you through the conditioning to make you believe that's what it is, because you're afraid, because you do not have the time to think about it. And that's what happens when we are stressed. We are no longer intelligent. We lose our consciousness. And if you see today in the media what's happening, we are bombarded by all this information about the corona and people are scared and even they're hurting themselves in spite of all the information and all the guidelines that are given, you know, through the media, social media, TV, everywhere. People are still not understanding because they're afraid. Okay. Okay? Okay, perfect. I continue? Yes, please. All right. So as you see here, I'm going to go into detail in this. So every part of our body is, will be affected with this chronic state of cortisol and adrenaline secretion. And as you can see on the left-hand side, we're going to talk about the cortisol side effect. We all you know, use prednisolone and steroids to treat our patient for different, you know, for different pathologies. What are the side effects of cortisol? You know, it stimulates appetite, gives you obesity, uh, it can cause diabetes, metabolic syndrome. Uh, it has significant impact on the musculoskeletal system. It increases blood pressure and can cause cardiovascular disease. It can cause dyslipidemia. It can cause exhaustion and burnout by affecting the brain. It decreases serotonin uh, production, leading to anxiety, depression, and suicide. And very important, we use it also as a immune modulator. You know, it's an immunosuppressant, and we know with immune modulator, it can 
affect inflammation. It can cause, you know, autoimmune disease, uh, inflammation and, and cancer. So you see all the side effects and please remember the side effect. These are the side effect of chronic use of steroids. Now, what is the results? What's the impact of this chronic stress today all over the world? This is what you see. This is in America. Okay. This is also in America in 2003. The Time magazine had uh, uh, reported the first case of type 2 diabetes, adult diabetes, in an 11 year old American female. So she was 11 year old, she was morbidly obese, and she had diabetes type 2. Chronologically, she was 11, biologically, she was 50. Okay? And this is the issue today, the big problem all over the world, it is the obesity in children. The obesity in children is becoming a big problem and it is the same process as you see in adult, the, the only thing it is, there is an accelerated aging process and it is associated with both short and long-term comorbidities such as insulin resistance, I'm talking in children, metabolic syndrome, arterial blood pressure, type two diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, sleep apnea syndrome, and most importantly, psychological problem, which is increase the risk for early mortality in adult life. So these are humans who, due to the chronic stress these children living in, will have an accelerated uh, 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 onset or occurrence of many diseases that end up killing them early on in life, besides the cost for the healthcare system. We talked about addiction as a response of those patients that retract. Let me, if you see this, somebody take a, a box of cigarettes on which is written smoking kills, smoking seriously harms you and other and around you. And one take a cigarette and smoke it. This person certainly is unconscious. He cannot be unconscious. Uh, so this is another lethal weapon which is the Hubble bubble smoking. And this is a collective suicide because each nephes that is smoked, you know, and sometimes it can go to two, three, each time is equivalent of one pack of cigarettes. And they are four, so multiply by four. So each person, if he does two or three nephes, you know, during a reunion for two, three hours, then they're smoking, you know, between nine to 12 uh, a pack of cigarettes. So you see, and it's spreading like hell today all over the world and mainly in the young population. And this is a third type of addiction. It is a screen addiction. And the screen addiction today is becoming a major problem. The screen and the information technology today is important. The internet is important, but as a sword with double edge, I think we have predominantly the use of internet. It's a negative usage. And this is the negative effect of the social media on people and users, depression, anxiety, cyberbullying, the FOMO, the unrealistic expectation, negative body image, and healthy sleep patterns, and sometimes suicide. Sometimes suicide because of this uh, um, struggling always to uh, uh, become a person that we cannot become or we find out that we, can, we are not this person and the disappointment and the and the excited create within us can lead sometimes to suicide. So what's happening with humanity, in fact, mainly over the last 20, 30 years today? You see, it took us Excuse me, bro. millions of years. Excuse me, because yes. this is very exciting. This is a very exciting part of the presentation. So uh, when it is allowed to, uh, for children uh, to use the media and uh, the Facebook, and, is there, is, there, is there any link between the, the abuse of media in the young age and the occurrence of diseases and uh, comorbidities in this young age? Uh, we don't have yet. We, th there is an indirect evidence because it is the sedentarity, the lack of movement. Children are not moving anymore. They're staying for hours and hours sitting. They don't do sport. They are not exposed anymore to, 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 to physical activity. So it, it, it is uh, uh, 
besides the fact that the impact that they have on their mind in terms of what I show you, the negative effect, you know, in terms of depression, in terms of anxiety, all this can trigger, you know, the stress and the cortisol uh, uh, production inside their body that can lead to the disease that we are talking about. And today, I will show you some statistics in children all over the world. You know, it's scary. I continue or there are other questions? I cannot hear you. Yes, please. I continue? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what happened to humanity mainly over, you know, since our existence, millions of years. In the first, you see, we have millions of years. It took us to come from the ape all the way to the, you know, to the, uh, to the 50 or 100 years ago, this, this guy here, you know, the, the sapiens, the homo sapiens. And from here, the macroevolution over the last 50 years, we went from here to here. The fat guy, you know, drinking and smoking. Before, they ate very healthy. They had to go through the jungle. They had to go and look for their food. They had to go and hunt. And whatever they had, they had a very healthy food. Today, we eat the junk food. You know, the processed food, the ultra-processed food. I will talk about it later. And this is ironic. Look at the 1990s. We have the big TV, the thing man. Now we have the big man, the thin TV. And this is where we're going now. The big man sitting in his fauteuil, drinking and smoking and not no longer going. And now we are forced to do it with the Corona. We don't go anymore to the supermarket. We deliver the food to the house and now we don't prepare our food. We have the robot as happened in China was delivering the food. If you saw on TV, delivering the food, you know, to, to us so we don't have to move. And this is what happened to children today. You know, processed food, junk food, sitting, watching TV, parents are away from home and, you know, and drinking and eating. Some statistics on obesity. You know, obesity, it's a very complex issue and it is a result of an interaction between different parameters such as genetic, environment, economic, and more than nearly one third of the world population today is obese. In the States, as I've shown you some pictures, 35% of the adults are classified as obese, and also one third of the children are either obese or morbidly obese in the States. Overweight and obesity, it is the fifth leading cause of death worldwide. There are nearly five million people who die every year from, from obesity. This is a very interesting study uh, published by the Lancet in 2018, looking at the socio-economical inequalities and its association with uh, level of income as well as non-communicable diseases, the NCD. What are the non-communicable diseases? Myocardial infarction, stroke, cancer, diabetes, obesity, physical activity, hypertension, and tobacco. This is what I've been talking about so far, okay? So they looked at if there is any association in terms of a between the low income level, uh, 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 socioeconomic inequalities, and these diseases. And this is a number, what you see the graph, the number of the studies over the years, over the last 30 years, and the color correspond to each non communicable disease. You see a lot of studies has been done and continue to be done on obesity, on diabetes, on cancer, uh, uh, you know, and on myocardial uh, uh, infarction. Uh, infarction. Okay, look what they show in this study that in fact, uh, the more study is done and more recent studies are done, they're showing more and more very strong association between the non communicable diseases and the risk factors for poverty and socioeconomical level. And this is where we, the Middle East, we are living in. We're living in a, unfortunately, with the exception of few countries, we're living in a, in a societies where, you know, we suffer from low income and, uh, and, and a lot of poverty. And as nephrologists, I'm a nephrologist. I don't know the audience. Are the audience all nephrologists or there are different? Uh... Nephrologists, all are nephrologists. All nephrologists, okay. So you see, we know today that in the States, for instance, 54% of the patient on dialysis in the States are diabetic and obese. So obesity, it's a major, major problem in nephrology. So what we, what we're seeing today, nephrologists, what we're dealing with the physical manifestation of obesity, it is as 
has been showing you it might be strongly associated with a disturbance in our energy. So obesity can affect kidney disease either directly, and I'm not going to go through the cytokines and all the, you know, the molecular uh, uh, mechanisms that lead to CKD, but believe me, there are, this is a review, very recent review, I believe in 2017, showing the importance of adipositin and its impact on CKD either directly or indirectly by causing the traditional risk factors such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. And this is a typical lesion of an obese, uh, obese person with being biopsy. You can see the focal, very high level focal segment of glomerulosclerosis at the spike of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of obesity. Liver disease also, it is another major problem. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is becoming today the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma. Before it used to be SCV and before SCV used to be alcohol. So now epidemiology have changed completely. These are the, in men and women, uh, the different number, the number per million of patients uh, dying, uh, you know, from according to age interval from this non-communicable disease. And I give you some statistics. Nearly 57 million people died in 2000. This was in 2017, I believe, the study. Uh, two, uh, uh, 57 million people died, uh, and the majority of these people, 70% of them, uh, died from non communicable diseases. And the majority of those who died from non communicable diseases, they died from cancer, obesity, as, as I mentioned before, respiratory disease, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease and hypertension. See, the alarming thing in all this is suicide. Today, people, society and humanity, they were talking about corona. You know, we have thousands, few thousands of people died from, from corona. I don't know if you know, but in this particular study, they have shown that nearly 800,000 people died in 2016 from suicide, which means amount to 40, every 40 seconds, we had a person that died from suicide. But the most scary thing, the most scary thing is between the interval, age interval between 15 and 30, suicide was represented the second leading cause of death. These are the young people who are supposed to be the future, who are supposed to be the healthiest and the happiest. They might be healthy in their body, but not healthy in their mind. And certainly they are not happy because they kill themselves. So, and this is what should ask humanity today, not about the corona and focus mainly on the corona. We should focus on this because this is a chronic problem that is getting worse. Corona will come and go. And this is a problem. That's why I say there is a problem with the energy. Now I move to the gut microbiota and you will see why I'm now, and, and we'll, we'll define what gut microbiota is, and I will look at it into health and disease. Certainly, I will go briefly over it because the amount of, as we will see, of information and the amount of literature that is emerging today is, is tremendous. What's gut microbiota? Microbiota, it is the gut, it is a population of infectious agents, mainly bacteria and funguses and some viruses, that live within us. So it's a population of infectious agents that live within us. And without this population, infectious population, we, we cannot die, we, we die. And if there is any dysbiosis, any uh, uh, disturbance in this population, also it will affect uh, our health. And of course, it's divided into two components, the bad guys and the good guys. And the good guys, you, I'm sure you all heard about, it's Kishiri, Kishiri. The E. coli, the lactobacillus, the bifidobacteria, and the bad guys, Enterobacter fecalis, Clostridium, this is some of them, not all of them, and Campylo, Campylobacter. You need to know that the number of cells that exist, infectious you know, bacteria, it is represent tenfold our, our, our own cells. Our own cells represent 50 trillion cells. We are formed from 50 trillion cells. So we have 10 times this, the number of bacteria. More important than this, 
the microbiome, which is these bacteria, uh, represent 98% of the total DNA that exists in our body. In other words, there is 100 times more DNA coming from the bacteria than our own DNA. So if you put the two DNA together, the human DNA and the bacterial DNA, 100%, 98% is bacteria, 2% is human, the one that we inherited from our parents. So imagine what is our genetic. It's bacteria genetic, it's not a human genetic anymore. And this mass of bacteria amount to 1.5 to 2 kilos. And each one of us, like our HLA is a unique HLA, each one of us has this mass of bacteria that is formed from more than 1,000 species, different species, unique to each one of us. There is not one microbiota similar to the other. It's, it's unbelievable. It's very important also to know that this microbiota change with age. With age, there is a, 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 a reduction in the diversity, what you see in the blue line, you know? It, the diversity, it decreases. You see, it becomes, see ratification. And there is also evolution of the type and species it change from young age to old age. This is an experiment to show the importance of microbiota and weight changes. They took two mice, the same diet, the same HLA, same genetic, the same color. One received on the left-hand side a microbiota from a thin woman. The offspring were normal. The, on the right-hand side, they received a microbiota from a, a fat woman, obese woman. The, the offspring were obese. Then they repeated the experiment, giving microbiota to the, 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 this uh, mice that were potentially supposed to become uh, you know, obese because she received microbiota from the fat woman. The offspring were normal. So you can see that the microbiota, depending where it comes from, has an impact on the weight change. And the conclusion from the study was published in Nature in 2006. This is information that 15 years ago, we don't medical schools are not teaching this anymore. They're not anymore, they don't teach it at all. So obese microbiome has an increased capacity to harvest energy from the diet. So these bacteria are so intelligent, they force they are intelligent in a way they get more calories, uh, you know, diet to be absorbed by the body. And most important, the trait is transmissible, which means if we colonize a, a, a germ-free mice with an obese microbiote, it results in a significantly greater increase in total body fat than colonization with a lean microbiote, as you, as, as you have seen. This is from the same group. They have shown that impacting or affecting or reducing the weight either through a fat restricted diet or a carbohydrate restricted diet with a different profile of microbiota, you can see the change in microbiota. This is at the time of obesity, when the, at time zero, and this is one year after weight loss, you can see the change in microbiota and start usually after five to 10% of weight loss, you see the change in the red increasing in the amount of microbiota that it is the bacteriobetes, which is a good bacteria. So you see, by changing our weight, we can also impact on the type and, the, and in, enhance the presence of good microbiota in our intestine. And now there's a lot of studies, uh, uh, and they, there is a kind of an agreement today that the, about the contribution of microbiota to obesity. The contribution of gut dys dysbiosis. The gut dysbiosis means the imbalance, the imbalance between the, the good and the bad guys. So the contribution of the gut dysbiosis to the pathology, pathophysiology of obesity is based on, there is an increased ability to harvest energy as, as I have shown you in the diet. There is an altered regulation of lipid and glucose metabolism in the periphery. And there is a systemic low grade inflammation against uh, lipopolysaccharide, <coughs> excuse me, and there is uh, uh, ability to increase insulin resistance. So they are responsible for inducing obesity and uh, uh, diabetes. And very important, the restoration of the gut microbiota, as I have shown you, uh, to a healthy state may ameliorate the condition associated with obesity and help maintain a healthy weight. What affect 
this gut microbiota. The junk food, it's slaughtered. It's slaughtered the microbiota. What is the junk food? Sugar, a lot of you know, processed food based on sugar. Uh, it really it creates an imbalance in the intestinal flora. Wheat breads, pasta, and biscuits contain gluten. All this can harm the, and disrupt the, the flora. This is a very interesting study published from the NIH in 2019, a few months ago, where uh, in cell, where they took 20 cohort of patients, divide them into two groups. One, 10 patients receive ultra-processed diet. The other on the right-hand side, they received uh, unprocessed, healthy diet, unprocessed diet. And they follow up this patient for 14 days. They ask, they put them on a, a 1,500 calorie uh, restricted uh, diet each with the same composition, of course, of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. And they ask the participant to reduce, restrict as much as they can their, their, uh, their caloric intake. And they follow them up for 14 days. After 14 days, the group on the left-hand side who received the ultra-processed diet ate on average 500 calories more than the one who ate uh, uh, natural, normal diet, they gained one kilos, while the other group who ate healthy food lost one kilo. So the conclusion of the study that uh, uh, body weight changes were correlated with diet difference in energy intake, and most important, ultra-processed foods stimulate appetite. So junk food make you eat more junk food. It's addictive. And this is a very interesting study, again, from 2019, from France, where they looked at the association between ultra-processed food, which means junk consumption, and the risk of mortality among middle-aged adults. And they have shown that after adjustment for a range of confounding factors, increase in the proportion of ultra-processed food consumed was associated with a higher risk of all-cause mortality. And the ultra-processed food consumption was associated mainly in young age, lower income, lower educational level, living alone, high body mass index, and lower physical activity. All this associated with the screen, I say. Very important thing, the industrial sweetness. This is supposed to be prevent diabetes. In fact, industrial sweetness like saccharin, sucralose, all kinds, they ravage. They are worse than the sugar. They ravage even more the intestinal flora. And this is a study published in Nature in 2014, where they looked at the impact of artificial sweetener. The conclusion was the artificial sweetness consumption in both mice and human enhances the risk of glucose intolerance by modulation of the composition and function of the microbiota. So you see the connection now. Atherosclerosis. Also, this is uh, uh, published in Nature, I believe also recently. They have shown that gut flora metabolism of phosphatidylcholine, which is a bioproduct that exists in a uh, uh, short, um, it's, a, it's a fatty acid. It exists uh, in uh, seafood, in cheese, and in meat. So the gut flora metabolism of phosphatidylcholine promotes cardiovascular disease. How? The, the, the gut flora transforms the choline into a triamtilin, uh, triamtilamine, TMA, and the TMA in the liver is transformed to TMAO, and the TMAO is known to be strongly associated with atherosclerosis and increased deaths from, uh, from high blood pressure, from heart attack, from, and from cardiovascular disease. Gut microbiota and kidney disease, you know, again, there is a significant now evidence, uh, associative evidence about the implication of novel mechanistic insight into the impact on gut microbiota and inducing and uh, chronic kidney disease and contributing to its progression through the four pathways that you can see by producing uremic toxins that can cause insulin resistance and peripheral vascular disease and thrombosis and by increasing the production of TMAO. Another pathway, it is the lipopolysaccharide pathway is to cause a, 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 a change in the endothelial cell function. Uh, uh, gut microbiota can impair the, uh, uh, the intestinal barrier and the intestinal permeability, leading to a state of microinflammation, causing uh, chronic kidney disease and aggravating it. And finally, also gut microbiota is responsible for an immune uh, deregulation that uh, uh, through cytokines, interleukins, that can ultimately lead also to the induction of chronic kidney disease and its progression. Cancer. 
microbiota is strongly associated with cancer. This is another interesting study uh, recently published in 2018, looking at the association between microRNA, which as you know, they are non-coding RNA molecules that can regulate the gene expression, and they play an important role in cancer development. In this study, in patients with colonic cancer, they found that there were uh, uh, significant uh, abundance of the microbes in the uh, tumoral environment as well as with the, the microRNA. And the conclusion was that uh, uh, the, uh, this is the first study that showed, uh, they did like a mapping, an association between the microbe, the host microRNA, in the, constant, in the context of colorectal cancer. So you see, I cannot go, I can go on and on for hours about the association between the, 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 the literature we have available now of the association between uh, uh, gut microbiota and the different kind of uh, non communicable diseases. I'm not going to go through it. Uh, 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 another important thing in, uh, that can affect uh, the microbiota, of course, it is birth, the way we are born. Uh, uh, of course, what's play against affect negatively the microbiota, C-section. And now there's an increase, tremendous increase in, in C-section. And also lack of breastfeeding. Very few mothers today, I, these lack of breastfeeding and C-section can deplete the microbiota. Antibiotic use, and we know today is used everywhere in the animal world, in the human world. It kills both the good and the, the bad, but most important, it allowed the bad to proliferate. And C. diff, we know today, is a major problem post-antibiotic therapy. Also, the aesthetic toxin and pollutants, we eat, we drink, we smell. I don't know what the air that we, you know, all the food, it's all full of toxins. And this is certainly will affect the microbiota. And there is a very important thing, and I go back to it, it's chronic stress. We know today chronic stress, as I will show you uh, briefly you now, after a few, few minutes, it can affect significantly and impact the microbiota at all stages of life. You know, when we, when we study in medical school, we were taught that once you have your neurons, they don't, we don't renew our neurons. We have a fixed amount of neurons. Well, this is not true anymore. We know we can produce neurons from the stem cells to the last moment of our life. But we need to know how to do it. And we know today that chronic stress can significantly impact on the regeneration in a negative way, of course, on the regeneration of new neurons at all stages, depending on our perception to our environment. So depending how we, we, we perceive stress, if we perceive negative way, this is certainly will impact on our uh, regeneration of the new neurons. Uh, these are experiments that have been done also to look at the impact of microbiota on behavior modification. This is uh, mice were taken newborn in a uh, delivered in a completely aseptic uh, uh, milieu. And they follow them when they became adult, they became very stressed and anxious. The same newborn treated with normal microbiota, it really released the reduction. There was significant reduction in the stress. A third experiment also were conducted, giving a pro, uh, a probiotic lactobacillus uh, at, uh, I think, one month after, the, uh, after birth. And again, there was significant reduction uh, in, the, in, in their stress. Uh, this is a study uh, showing the association between depression uh, and uh, neurobehavioral modification and changes in microbiota. Uh, depression is known now today has been shown to be associated with decrease in gut microbiota, richness and diversity. And most important, the transplantation of fecal microbiota from depressed patients to microbiota depleted rats can induce behavioral and physiological features characteristic of depression in the recipient animal. So you see the trait is transmissible. This suggests that the gut microbiota may play an important role in the development of features of depression. So why the human microbiota is important? You can see now that it's involved in all kinds of disease affecting nutrition, immunity, uh, uh, you know, asthma, eczema, cancer, diabetes, obesity, malnutrition, autoimmune disease, celiac disease, colitis, and of course, very important, neurogenerative and psychiatric and behavior disorder. Look at the tremendous amount of data that has been emerging literature on microbiota and its impact on our health. Over the last year, more than 11,000 papers have been published. 
on microbiota. It's, it's unbelievable. This is a new field that is exploding today. And I think we're going to see more and more of this in the, in the future. And you can see over the last five, six years that we have this, this explosion. So what is a gut microbiota hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis? Now I'm going to put the two together. You know, scientists have found today, we know if you read, uh, an intimate relationship between the brain and the gut microbiota. And we went up to the way to say that we have two brains now. We have the upper brain and we have the microbiota brain, the intestinal brain. And these two brains, they constantly interact with each other in, into a bi-directional way. In a way, it can affect the state of health of our physical health as well as our mental health. For, for those among you who are interested, this is a very recent review a few months ago from, I think, the American, uh, from the Physiology Review, the American Journal of Physiology. It's 150 papers. It has all the data. It's fantastic on microbiota. So for you, uh, and I advise each one of you, this is, should be introduced as a curriculum in the medical schools. So what is the microbiota gut brain axis? And this is depending on coming from a lot of data, a lot of analysis. I'm, called, I'm going to call the MGB. The MGB axis is a part of a comprehensive physiological network that includes an endocrine system, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. We talked about it and its importance in stress. Immune system, we talked about the immune system, its importance and through cytokine and chemokine. The autonomic nervous system, including uh, the efferent and afferent neurons that the efferent, as you will see, that comes out of the brain to the guts and what comes out of the guts to the brain, and the enteric nervous system. It has an independent enteric nervous system. This gut microbiota are thought to act on the hypothalamic axis and the vagal nerve by producing bacterial metabolites via tryptophan metabolism you will see that the tryptophan, which is a, one of the uh, 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 substance for uh, happiness hormone, tryptophan is very important for serotonin. 95% of the tryptophan is produced in the guts, not in the brain. So the tryptophan is produced in the guts. So look, this is the axis. So what's telling us this, uh, you know, we have the brain, and the brain can be affected by stress directly, or the microbiota can be affected by stress also directly, chemical or physical stress. Now you see this, it's a bi-directional relationship. Why? This is the vagal nerve. 80% of the, the vagal nerve fiber, they come from the intestine all the way to the brain, and 20% only from the brain all the way to the intestine. This is the intestinal lumen where we have the microbiota that produce 95% of the tryptophan. So for any kind of stress that affect the brain, we already said, I have shown you, this is what trigger, any alert will trigger a, a chain of uh, uh, reactions with the hypothalamus producing a, a, a certain hormones and leading to the adrenal gland that produce the adrenaline and the cortisol. What the cortisol does, in fact, it impacts on the permeability of the intestinal wall, and this is will affect, and then you will have the leak of liposaccharide, uh, lipo, uh, liposaccharides, which are produced by the microbiota. They can leak because of the imp uh, impairment of the permeability of the intestine, and this will trigger a cytokine reaction that will affect the brain directly, or this microbiota can produce other substance, such as small chain uh, fatty acid, that can diffuse and cross the intestinal barrier to the blood all the way to affect the brain. So you see whether the microbiota is affected directly or through the stress through the brain, you have this bi-directional effect, the brain affecting the microbiota and the microbiota affecting the brain. And this is will explain now how the human physiology functions. It is the psychoneuroimmunology. So we have in 
upon stress, we have a neurological trigger that will lead to the production of a hormonal system that affect our body as well as our immune system. And all this is, is controlled by a, a mental and um, energetic field. So this, bi this bidirectional interaction uh, between the gut uh, microbiota and the brain, it is uh, uh, really happen. It's irrespective or regardless of the sequence of the event that lead to the state of dysbiosis in a particular disorder. So it depends whether it is the microbiota that comes first or the brain first. This would lead to alteration in the microbial community that are likely to affect the bidirectional communication between the gut and the brain. And such influences may occur early on in life and affect the development of the nervous system, the brain interaction with the intestine, and the hypothalamic pituitary axis. This is, again, looking at uh, PubMed a few, uh, few months ago, probably now there's more, the amount of studies only published on the microbiota brain gut axis. Last year, there were uh, uh, more than nearly 500 papers that, that, that has been uh, published. It was a total of 1,828 papers. So if we want to go back to see on stress, you know we are surrounded by stress. Our environment, we perceive it all the time, you know, through our sensory system. So the stress, we perceive it, and our perception of stress depend on the way we are, we believe. So it is our beliefs that affect the way we perceive the stress. So the issue is not the stress itself, it is the way we believe we are perceiving it that will determine, will translate into a thought, and this thought would lead to a certain feeling and a certain emotion that will translate into a specific mental and physical behavior. If our perception of the stress is positive, then our mental and physical behavior will be positive. If our perception is negative, then we have a sick and unhealthy mental and physical behavior. What is very important that these beliefs comes from our domestication process. So it is the way we are domesticated, the way we are programmed, that will deliver a specific belief in us that will affect the way we perceive our environment and perceive the stress. Stress is very healthy. We cannot live without stress. It is life, stress is the origin of life. It is the way we deal with it. It's the way we perceive it. And you can see today, the way we are dealing with the stress, it's very destructive, very negative. Our thoughts become translated into chemistry. So the belief in your thought and the thought will translate into chemistry and the chemistry will translate into specific behavior. This is science. 3000 years ago, Buddha have said, what we think we become. So look at the, how intelligent, how deep they were, our, our fathers and our ancestors. Look at, I'm sure you all heard about the Razi. The body behavior shadow the manners of the mind, which means whatever happened in our mind, it will impact on our body's behavior and our body's health. This is a Rumi. The world exists as you perceive it. It's not what you see, but how you see it. It's not what you hear, but how you hear it. It's not what you feel, but how you feel it. Mahatma Gandhi, see all these great people. Our belief become our thoughts. Our thoughts become our world. Our words become our actions. Our actions become our habits. Our habits become our values. And our values become our final destiny. He's saying that whatever we believe, it will determine what happened to us. Positive, positive. Negative, negative. We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So if I want to summarize, we are certainly living today, given the stressful environment we're living in. We are living in the programmation that we undergo. We are living in a subconscious state that is the result of a, a process of domestication that is initially involuntary because when we are children, we have no control over it, then become voluntary through the media. This domestication process program our subconscious mind. That become the mind of control of our life because we're living a very stressful environment, it'll make us lose our intelligence 
And this put us into this subconscious state. This subconscious state would lead us to become into a survival chronic retraction mode since we cannot run away and we cannot fight. And this chronic retraction mode, which is a stressful mode, is mediated by the chronic production of adrenaline and cortisol that lead to the state of psychological, emotional, and physical retraction that is responsible for most of the non-communicable diseases. So the take home message, Acquire, our acquired beliefs through our domestication influence our perception, our reaction to stress that determine our outcome. The subconscious mind program by the acquired belief has major influence on our perception of stress, its amplification and its impact on the state of our mental and physical health. In the current stressful environment, the powerful subconscious mind become dominant and put a sizable proportion of humans in a continuous, retractive, uh, uh, freezing, protective, freezing survival mode. This continuous stressful state is mediated in ongoing activation uh, of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gut microbiotal axis. It results into the state of psychological, emotional, and consequent uh, physiological uh, uh, retraction that is responsible for many of the non communicable diseases that is affecting humanity today and the resulting morbidity and mortality. The bidirectional interaction between the HPA and the gut microbiota may play a pivotal role. So it is time for humans to become conscious and reprogram their subconsciousness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bar Barbary, for this excellent uh, presentation and unusual idea. I, I want just to add some points because I believe in this, uh, in, in what you mentioned. Uh, in, our, in the nephrology literature currently in this month, there's a link between uremic toxins in dialysis and occurrence of depression, and the, uh, the axis of inflammation and depression is published in very recent articles. Regarding gut microbiome and uh, uh, the other factors like breastfeeding, breastfeeding uh, is protective uh, so we should encourage breastfeeding for a uh, proper time because the literature in the American literature showed if lactation is less than one year, there is problems of obesity in adulthood and later on diabetes. Antibiotics in early life and the antibiotics in adults exceeding 28 days disturbs gut microbiome and increase even urinary, urinary stones uh, through disturbing Oxalobiome. So a lot of issues are there. Even uh, the uh, cola and diet cola disturbs as well gut microbiome that can lead to coronary kidney disease. So I want to add to the axis that you mentioned, gut, kidney, brain axis. Uh, thank you very much. And if there is any question, I'll be, I'll be very, very happy. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Antoine. Actually, I have two questions for you. Uh, if your time allows. Please, Mohammed. Uh, hello, Dr. Antoine. Yes, as I, I, I hear you. Yeah, uh, I, as I got from, from the presentation that there were many trials um, showing the association between the disturbance in gut microbiota and the occurrence of several diseases like colon cancer and obesity. Is there any trial that used the beneficial gut microbiome in actual treatment of such a disease, even in animal studies? Is there anything like that? There, there are trials, but the, in, in animals. You know, uh, the, the problem with all these trials, they are very short-lived trials. Remember what happened, it, uh, what's happening with the microbiota, it's going to, it's take, it takes time. So you yes. cannot, and this trial to do a long-term trial is a very costly trial. There is now today many, many trials going on to look at the impact of probiotics, you know, at uh, fecal implantation, transplantation, you know, and their impact to correct the problem. But remember that these are, they don't happen between one day and the other. Whatever pathology I describe, these are pathology for many, many, many years. So it's going to take time, if anything, the probiotics. But remember, the probiotics, it's only a drug. So if you take probiotics or uh, uh, whatever you do in terms of uh, 
and you still have the problem, the mind problem, that you're living still stress because you can be stressed independent of the microbiota. It would not change anything. So I think what we need to do, work on the physical part and also work on the energetic part. The energetic part, it means the counseling part, the coaching part. This is where physicians themselves are become capable of guiding their patient. You know, we do not cure our patients. We are not, if any physician will believe he cured his patient, it's not true. We should, our role should be to guide our patient for them to heal themselves by explaining to them why they became what they became. And believe me, I practice this. I practice in my clinic. It's a, it's a time consuming, but I practice what I call holistic medicine. Holistic medicine where I explain what I explained to you today in a very simplified way to the patient, what's happening to me. How can you treat a patient 140 kilo diabetic, hypertensive, and kidney disease? You cannot treat him. Yeah. You have to make him realize that he created his own illness because of the process that I, as, as I described, and it's up to him to cure himself, to heal himself if he wants through the guidance that you can give him as a physician. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my last question is, um, uh, it's, it's about our era with the coronavirus. You know, most of our families, or even all our families are quarantined in houses, except the, the physicians who go to the hospital every day. And then the, the prolonged homestay will lead to um, uh, uh, further depression and, and further obesity. And uh, most of the experts uh, claim that the era of coronavirus might extend to 18 months. A year and a half. Now, how can we break this circle of, of prolonged home staying and, 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 and the lack of exercise and you know, the more obesity and, and, and the more depressive thoughts? Uh, well, you, you have to go back to I exercise, I, I try to exercise uh, every day. You know, and at home, you can do some exercise at home, There's no problem. Today I walked, but um, I'm not, we're not supposed to walk. So, yesterday and today I, I walked. Uh, so, you can exercise at home. You have to make sure that you eat healthy at home because the tendency, if you stay stressed, you're going to eat more because of the cortisol. And because you're not moving, you're going to gain weight. But most important, the work should be on the way you're perceiving the situation. If you perceive it in a negative way, no matter what you do or you don't do, it will impact on you. I don't see it. I'm not afraid. I'm trying to understand. You know, it's extremely important to try to understand what's going on. And most important to ask yourself the question, okay, if I'm afraid, what's going to happen? Am I going to change anything in the situation? Nothing. I'm going to be hurt? Yes. So better not to be afraid. And since we are all believers in God, you know, Muslims and Christian, we deliver ourselves. Islam. Min sallam. And I'm sallam. And I'm Muslim. And I'm a Sihah Muslim. يسوع المسيح قبل ما يموت هو أول من سلم قال يا أبتاه ابعد عني هذه الكأس وإذا كانت هذه مشيئتك فلتكن see so he accepted the, and I think what's happening today with the corona please don't think I'm crazy I think it's extremely positive it's a very strong message it's very strong message from the Almighty, from the Creator. We went the wrong way. See the last slide I put? It is time for us to become conscious. We are in a subconscious state. We are living in a, in a, in a crazy world focused on materialism, consumerism, you know, greed, power. We don't need all this. We don't need it. Look at now. It's, our life is very simple. And we are alive. And we are eating and we are talking. Look, I, and I work all day. I work, I read. Now I'm I'm searching to see the origin of the corona. And hopefully one day I will give a lecture about this. I think it is technology. You know, you cannot mess up with Mother Earth. You cannot mess up with the electromagnetic energy. We are energy. The Earth has an unbelievable electromagnetic field. And we are connected to this field through our own field. You know, we have electromagnetic, you know, the MRI, magnetic resonance imaging is what? It is a machine that depicts 
the energy that is emitted by every one of your cell, send it to a, a computer and form an image according to the reception. So you have the brain, you have the shoulder, you have the, wh wh whatever you have. So we have electromagnetic field. And all this technology that we're learning today, we are surrounded by electromagnetic energy. Wherever you're at home, appliances, computer, phones, Wi-Fi, where do you go? And I think this new technology is crazy. And maybe, Hassan, you should look into it. Apparently, the, they use the 60 gigabytes, uh, sorry, the 60 gigahertz wave. It is a very millimetric wave, but very fast wave in order to uh, ensure a very rapid transmission you know, at the end point of the, of, of the circuit. And apparently, this 60 gigahertz, it is absorbed by oxygen. And that's why it can delay, be delayed if you have water, if you have rain, you know, if you have nature, if you have leaves, because it absorbs. And we are formed from what? We are formed from oxygen and from water. And water is what? H2O. So apparently is when the oxygen absorbs this energy, the molecule, which has two atoms, they share four electrons. And this energy hit the electrons, excites them, stimulate them, and change completely the configuration of the, the oxygen, which make it very difficult to bind to the heme, the hemoglobin, when we breathe it. So some people believe today that we are producing our own viruses. How? When you are subjected to a toxin, as we heard today, physics, chemistry, you know, whatever, energetic, our body responds to defend itself. Every cell responds in a way to handle this toxin by creating certain proteins or certain extract of RNA or DNA that later on will be excreted. The virus is what? It is a protein and RNA or protein and DNA. So we might, and look at the, I don't know if it's a coincidence, where it abrupted the epidemic. Tell me where. China. Where, where else? Um, I think in Germany they're doing a very good job. They are limiting the... the, the, the but before the... Germany, where, where? In Far East? Korea? In Korea, yeah. Where else in, in Europe? Korea because the most they, extended, important... they extended the screening test. They extended the screening test. Yeah. As... Where else in Europe? In Europe? Catastrophe. Italy? Italy. Italy and, and Iran. Spain. Italy and, and Iran. Spain. And here in UK we are... And, you know, and these are the countries they have, and Switzerland. Switzerland today stopped the 4G, and Germany. These are the countries who have started the 5G. That's what they have in common. And apparently, the virus is not, the sequence of the virus is not the same. It's different in China, from Italy, from Iran, which probably could be explained by the fact that our genetic background will determine the structure of the RNA in response to the, according to our RNA or DNA, no? We don't have, Iranian and Chinese have nothing to do, or Korean with each other, or Italian. So I think this is where it comes from. Now, it will be very difficult to prove it, but I think, and you see through history, every time there was a messing or changing in the electromagnetic field of Earth, there were catastrophes. You know, uh, I'm preparing now a, a workshop on the power of thought. You, you saw me today, I spoke about thought. And uh, I will be talking about the importance of energy in our body. We are energy. We are energy. And in fact, our system is designed to use with predilection, preferably always the energy, the electromagnetic energy. Why? because it's energy saver. When you use energy, any reaction that is mediated by electromagnetic signal, 99%, there's only 1% waste of energy. 99% is preserved. While chemical and thermodynamic energy, 98% of the reaction is lost. Only 2% is preserved. So the most efficiency, and that's why I explained with such a complexity we are, we only can function through the energy. You know, the speed of the electromagnetic energy is 300,000 kilometers per second. The speed of a chemical reaction is one meter per second. 
So tell me, what is the most important for our body to function? And I showed you in one of the slides, even it's, the electromagnetic speed is faster, you know, uh, function than the neurological function because there, there is neurotransmitter, there's chemistry in it. So you see, I think we need to, that's why I, you saw me, I started spiritual in my talk because yeah. I really believe, I truly believe we are energy. And if you look at the, at the cosmos, if you, as a scientist, the cosmic evolution, it started as energy, then chemistry, atoms, then biology. And now we have the information. So we are energy. Anything that anybody who do not understand that we are energy cannot understand the complexity of the human being. It's so important to believe this, and even at the spiritual level. So what we're trying to do, me, what I'm showing here, that spirituality and science, they go very well together. In fact, spirituality, they were much more intelligent than us. They knew many things that we cannot figure out. Today, through our science, we are proving what they said thousands of years ago. Dr. And you know, there are many examples in the Quran of this. Muhammad. دكتور دولت ريزس هير هاند انا اوريدي فتحت عليها تقدر تتكلم اتفضل ثانك يو فيري ماتش بروفيسور انطوان فور ذس ماسيف هيوج ليكتشر اكشولي كان بي ديفايدد انتو ماني ورك شوبس ماني نيد ماني يو رايت يو رايت بس يو نو فور ذا تايم اند ماي اي هاف تو كويستشنز وان سيمبل كويستشن اباوت ذا مايكروبايوت بايوت يو سيد ذات or I understood that we are all born with the same one and somehow uh, the environment and we destroyed by many means. Absolutely. Right. right. So how... No, uh, not, not the same microbiota. We are born with a, a specific microbiota to each one of us. Yes, a normal one. A, a normal, normal one. If we are born, you know, our birth is uh, 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 according to its uh, natural conditions. Right, uh, although I don't see how a cesarean section is going to affect it, but anyway. No, no, I, I, I'll explain to you. C-section, it is a sterile birth. Yes, that's right. We don't go through the vagina, so the child gets the... That's why the mother, 20% of the microbiota come from the mother. Okay, okay. That's you why you are so important, female. Yes. Proven. Now, Without you, there's no life. Dr. Dawla, right. it was proven that a cesarean section increases the risk of allergy and asthma. So yeah. absolutely, because absolutely. delivery so, through vagina raises some bacteria, microbiota uh, that was not w in the case of cesarean section. All right. The other thing is, if I have a certain disease condition and I have a doubt that there is a disturbance in the microbiota causing this condition, how can I pinpoint or diagnose it? Uh, 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 let's say bronchial asthma. Let's say what, whatever multiple diseases you you mentioned today. How can I pin, is there a certain investigation I can do to diagnose the uh, abnormality of the microbiota of this patient? Uh, for the time, as I told you, each one of us has a specific microbiota. Right. Now, most of the studies I have shown you, they are associative studies. It would be extremely difficult given the diversity of the microbiota. It would be extremely difficult and you need a huge number of patients to prove a specific stereotype of microbiota as associated with specific disease. It's impossible. Okay. But we know that the, there is a different, different patterns of microbiota between people with respiratory disease and people with asthma and people without it. Right. But there's no one specific Dr. type. Dr. Antoine, I think in, in, in CKD and dialysis, the brand of gut microbiota is very clear because uremic toxin is, is our products of disturbed gut microbiome. Am it's I correct. right? Correct, exactly. So, so probably the, 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 it's going to be the prevention more uh, than... Uh, absolutely. We know there is a very strong association, you know. So what matters at the, at the end, again, it's not only the microbiota. Remember the microbiota, there is a bidirectional effect. Yes. If you, most important is what you do in your mind. It is the fear. You know, it is the way you are programmed. It is the way you are dealing with stress that will, independent whether you have a disease or not, will impact on your microbiota. So no matter what you do at the periphery, no matter what you do, 
if you do not control the center, the energetic field, you know, that nothing will happen because you go back to the same problem that started. Okay. Uh, my other question uh, uh, belongs to the first part of your lecture. And you said there is a, a state of unconsciousness which uh, covers the uh, addiction to drugs, addiction to screens, uh, overeating. What does the unconscious state, uh, how can it correlate with the subconscious state? I didn't understand this. Oh, the, the unconscious state, it, there are three minds. The unconscious mind is the mind where you have the automatic function that are important for survival, which is the immune system, the respiratory system, and the cardiac system. Okay, this is the unconscious mind. The subconscious mind, it is a mind or the emotional mind, it controls the three functions. You know, when you're stressed out, you're tachycardic, you breathe fast. You know, there is a way to control the subconscious mind. Okay. The, 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 what I said about the addiction mm -hmm. is, as we said, if we, are, if we look at ourselves as a spiritual, spiritual entity and are not happy with the way the system is imposing upon us, you know, this domestication uh, factors. So if we are a weak entity that we are incapable or, of fighting or running away, so what do we do? We surrender. Right. And when we surrender, we surrender in a very unhappy, you're not happy, you surrender. So in a way for you to get a refuge to get protected, you go into a certain things that provide you with certain happiness. Okay. This, there are different, each one choose its own way how he can manifest his happiness as a running away from the fact he cannot adapt to the system, but he cannot accept it, but he's, he's forced to stay within the system. So he, right. he, he creates like a refuge, a word for himself that make him believe that is providing him with happiness. But in fact, it is a subconscious state. All right, yes. Who are these people? I told you who are these people. Mm. They can be through I... eating disorders, through you know, psychological problems, through you know, uh, obesity, through psycholo you know, the depression, anxiety, or autism. You know, artists, I believe artists too, uh, because they have a higher level of perception of the world, of their environment. They see it in a different way than we do. You see quite often, and you can ask artists quite often. You know, I asked several artists, where, when you feel that you give the best out of you, you know what they answer? When they're stressed out. Okay, yes. When they're stressed out, mm -hmm. I have my son too. He's an artist. Right. When, you know, he does like he, uh, um, drawing, you know, uh, 3D. He's been drawing since the age of five in 3D. So right. I, uh, and he does things in 10, 15 minutes that, that a computer it takes maybe two hours to do it. Right. So I asked him, how, how can you do it? When you, he says, when I am that stressed out, this is the best I can do. He said, I don't know. When I start, I don't have an idea in my head. It comes out. Yes. So stress so is a see, in a way. So yes. Of course, that's why I say stress could be beneficiary if you know how to deal with it. So the artist release his stress in being creative, in being conscious, because creativity is consciousness. Right. And you mentioned, I heard you say autism. Autistic, oh, of sorry. course. You know, in the States today, yes. uh, one out of 59 births is autistic births. Okay. So compared the... to one out of uh, thousands of births. And if you look at an autistic child, of course, there is a spectrum of autistic disorder. But if in general, when you look at the autistic child, is withdrawn child, is disconnected from his environment. So most likely, these children have something they came up with during the maternal, maternal or early life that had put them into this situation. Right. And autistic children can be extremely creative, by the way. Huh? Yes, that's right. That's right. Make you know, can. can be extremely creative. Yes. can be uh, wonderful and certainly emotionally and they are beautiful and wonderful. This That's is not right. a discrimination against autistic, but I'm saying it's a way, it's a form of, of, of running this, away from, running. Yeah. from the domestication. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any further Thank questions? Uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, I'm, I'm appreciating 
and uh, full of gratitude to Professor Antoine Berberi for giving us this time. Thank you very much, Professor Berberi, and we hope to meet again and again and again. We will, and I hope when I finish my preparation for the workshop, uh, I have certain things for stress too. I can, uh, we can share also yes. on stress, uh, origin of stress, where it comes from, manifestation of stress, uh, uh, impact of stress on us. And in the second uh, part of the workshop is uh, uh, how to deal with stress, you know? Um, what is the approach to, to stress in terms of dealing with it to solve it? And I'm preparing now also a talk on, on, on you know, the workshop. I told you on the power of the thought. This will be very interesting for you because also I'm mixing a lot of uh, science, philosophy, religion, all kind of things, you know. With, uh, so I hope we'll, maybe we can share in the future this. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure for me to share it with you. And thank you for, for being there, for waiting. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.